ask you to open your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. And as you turn there, let me just tell you our passage this morning is full to the brim of just wonderful theological truths, glorious realities for those of us who are Christians. And just these five short verses, Paul is going to cover the believer's mortification of sin, our adoption in Christ, our assurance of salvation, our being heirs with Christ in our glorification, and much more. In reality, we could probably break this passage up into not only two sermons, but perhaps three or four. There is a lot here for us this morning. But I believe we can cover the main point that Paul is making for us this morning and see how all of these fit together and how they describe our life in the Spirit. So let me begin by reading Romans chapter 8, verse 12. I'm going to read through verse 17. So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. I've titled our sermon this morning, Life in the Spirit, because what Paul covers in these verses are really the implications of our being spirit-filled Christians, as Steve pointed us to last week. Steve covered verses 9 through 11 last week and showed how those of us who are in Christ, those of us who are part of the new covenant, we are not just empowered by the Spirit for a task or for a season like we see throughout the Old Testament. Steve showed us that throughout the Old Testament last week, but we in the new covenant are actually indwelt by the very third person of the Trinity, by the very Spirit of God himself. And that glorious reality carries glorious and weighty responsibilities and ramifications for us as Christians. It's like that adage that comes from Spider-Man. You remember, with great power comes great responsibility. We could rephrase that and say, with great privilege comes great responsibility. And such is the case for us as spirit-filled Christians this morning. So What does it look like? Verses 9 through 11, we are filled with the Spirit. What does that actually look like now in our lives, and what are the ramifications for that? That's what we're going to look at here in verses 12 through 17. I believe we see Paul give us at least six things this morning that characterize this Spirit-filled life. And the first of those is that this Spirit-filled life is a life of holiness. It begins in verse 12, so then brothers. Again, this is drawing implications from the previous verses. In light of what I just said, in light of the fact that you are indwelt by the Spirit of God, in light of that, so then brothers, here's some conclusions to draw. And the first thing he says here in verse 12, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body you will live. I want you to notice several things about these verses that Paul points us to. First, notice he says that we are debtors, or as some translations put it, perhaps your translation, we are under obligation. You see, the Christian life is not one that is free from any obligation whatsoever. We are certainly no longer slaves of sin. We are no longer slaves to the flesh. Paul's been making that clear for us throughout this letter so far. But in our being set free, it is not that we are now debtors to nothing. It is not that we are now free from everything. Rather, in being freed from slavery to sin and being freed from slavery to the flesh, we become slaves to something else. We become slaves to righteousness slaves to Christ. In light of all that Christ has done for us and his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, there is a great 
responsibility or as the word in our passage, there is a great debt, a great obligation upon us as those in him, those whom the father has adopted to live lives pleasing to him. We are debtors, he said, but then he makes sure there's no confusion very quickly. We are debtors, but not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. He quickly wants to make sure there's no confusion here, no misunderstanding. He's been hammering on this truth for several chapters now that we are in Christ and free from the law, free from sin, free from death. So we are debtors not to the flesh, he says. And then look at verse 13. He lays out for us a conditional statement. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. What Paul is speaking of here in this verse is what theologians have historically referred to as the mortification of sin. The mortification of sin. Now that's a word that's probably, I would guess, unfamiliar to several of you this morning. When's the last time that you have used the word mortification or the verb form to mortify in your everyday language. My guess is among us, not very often. But it's historically been called this, the mortification of sin, because that's the word that the King James Version used to translate this verb here, to put to death. It's the word to mortify. That's what the word means. It's a killing of sin, a putting to death of the flesh. It's a ruthless, full-hearted resistance to everything that is sinful and to the indwelling sin that resides in us. As we consider this life of holiness that is to characterize our spirit-filled life, I want to just camp out for just a moment on this topic of the mortification of sin before we move on. Scripture is very clear as to the importance of our killing our sin. Scripture is very clear that there is to be no peace with sin. One author puts it like this, we dare not baptize our sins with benedictions. Jesus put the importance of putting our sin to death starkly in the Sermon on the Mount. Remember his words in Matthew 5, verse 29 through 30, if your right eye causes you to sin, what? Tear it out and throw it away. For it's better for you to lose one of your members than your whole body be thrown into hell. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off, throw it away. It's better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. Tear it off, cut it out. Jesus does not mince his words in the slightest here in how we are to relate to our sin. In another of his letters, Paul writes in Colossians 3 verse 5, again, put to death or mortify, therefore, what is earthly in you. And then in Colossians, he now gives us a list of some things that would be included in that. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Derek Thomas notes this, we are in the midst of a war in which the enemy is sin. And not just sin in general, but particular sins with names, such as lust, envy, pessimism, laziness, greed, and gossip. We must show these enemies no quarter. John uh, John Owen has famously said, many of you are familiar with this quote, be killing sin or it will be killing you. This war with sin is a matter of life and death for us. Paul puts it bluntly here in verse 13, doesn't he? You live according to the flesh you die. You put to death the deeds of the body by the power of the Spirit, you live. Now, this is in no way Paul arguing for any sort of works-based salvation. This is not Paul saying that we are justified by grace, and then whether or not we reach the finish line is really up to us and up to whether we make this war within. That's not what he's saying at all. But it is clear throughout the book of Romans, it's clear throughout the New Testament as a whole, that whether or not we make war or make peace with sin, whether or not we actively pursue a life of holiness empowered by the Spirit of God or not, these are key indicators as to whether we are truly in Christ or not, as to whether or not the Holy Spirit truly dwells within us. You see, making war with sin does not save us, but refusing to make war with sin and instead making peace with sin 
is indeed an indicator that we may not have truly been saved. Notice here also the role of grace in our mortification. Don't miss that little phrase in verse 13 in the second half. If you live according to the flesh, you'll die. But if, don't miss that next phrase, by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you live. You see, that little phrase, by the Spirit, makes all the difference. It's only because of the grace of God that he has lavishly and unconditionally poured upon us through the gift of faith, through the gift of regeneration, and then indwelling us with the very Spirit of God that any of us in this room even have a remote chance at finding victory in this fight in putting our sins to death. Well, how are we to do this? How are we to mortify, to kill sin in our life? Let me offer you five quick things before we move on to our second main point. First, we must recognize the presence of sin in our flesh. We must be willing to confess honestly with Paul in Romans seven twenty one. I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. If we do not admit to sin, admit to the presence of sin in our life, admit to the power of temptation in our flesh, we are deluding ourselves and becoming more and more susceptible to its influence in our lives. Rather, we must be humble before God, we must be humble before ourselves, we must be humble before others, and open and honest about the presence of sin and temptation in our life. And also to realize that because of the influence of our human weakness and the limitation of our thinking, it can also even be difficult to recognize the specific sins that are in our lives. And so we need our brothers and sisters in Christ to help us in that area. We also must be willing to pray humbly those words of David in Psalm 139, Search me, O God. Know my heart. Try and know my thoughts. See if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. So we must recognize the presence of sin in our life. Secondly, we must have a heart fixed on God. David said to the Lord in Psalm 57, 7, My heart It's steadfast, O Lord. My heart is steadfast. I will sing. I will make melody. Psalm 119, verses 5 and 6. Oh, that my ways be steadfast in keeping your statutes. Then I shall not be put to shame, having my eyes fixed on all your commandments. We must recognize that if we are ever to find victory against sin, victory against our flesh in putting to death that which is earthly in us, in mortifying that which is sinful in us, We must begin by having our eyes fixed on God, having our heart fixed on God and particularly fixed on his word. That leads to our third way to mortify sin. That is, we must meditate on God's word. Many of God's truths in his word only become clear to us as we immerse ourselves deeply in a passage of scripture, allowing the Lord to give us a deep understanding of his word, specific applications to our lives. And we can only do that if we are giving ourselves to the regular reading of God's word, the regular meditation of God's word, the regular memorization of his word. We might declare with the psalmist, I have stored up your word in my heart. Why? That I might not sin against you. Fourth, we must commune regularly with God in prayer. Peter calls on us in 1 Peter 4, 7 to be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. When we're faithful in these disciplines of Bible reading, Bible meditation, and prayer, we realize how interconnected all of these things really are. As we read his word, as we soak in his word, as we meditate upon his word, a right meditation upon the word of God will inevitably and will naturally lead to communing with God in prayer. God speaks to us through his word. We speak back to him through prayer. And finally, we must practice obedience to God. MacArthur puts it like this, doing his will and his will alone in all the small issues of life can be training in habits that will hold up in the severe times of temptation. Paul himself has already shown in Romans chapter 7 that putting death, putting sin to death is often difficult, it's often slow, and it's often frustrating, isn't it? Satan is the great adversary of God's people, and he will make every effort to tear us down and to draw us into sin. 
And, and so as we seek to mortify sin in our lives, as we seek to put to death sin in our lives, we must not only focus on the big things or the crisis moments as they come, but we must train ourselves for godliness in the small things, practicing obedience to God in all small areas of life, small to big. This is why it's so important to have conversations with people and they say, you're making such a big deal about such a small thing. It's not a small thing if God's word is clear on it. If God's word is clear on it, no matter how small we think it might be, our obedience in the small areas of God's word will lead to obedience in the big areas of God's word. And if we are not willing to practice obedience in the small areas, we can rest assured that we will fail in the bigger areas. So we must practice obedience to God and his word. Well, I'm sure that much more could be said on this topic of mortifying sin. This is one of those that I thought to myself, man, we could have a whole sermon right here camping out in verses 12 and 13. But I'm going to move on in verse 14 now. So the life in the spirit is a life of holiness, first and foremost. Secondly, this life in the spirit is a life of leading. Paul says after those conditional statements in verse 13, verse 14, he says, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Now it's important to note here what Paul does and does not mean by being led by the Spirit. Many want to take a verse like this, take this exact verse, and think that being led by the Spirit means that the Spirit helps me make all of my decisions in life choosing the right spouse, finding the right job, living in the right location, and so forth. But that's not the context of this verse here. The context of this verse is that verse 14 is a continuation of verse 13. Verse 14 begins with that Greek word gar, which we translate for or because. Paul's trying to tie what he's saying in verse 14 to what he just said in verse 13. Verse 13, he says that the Spirit, that with the Spirit, we really can triumph over sin within us. And then he explains why this great power, power over sin, is available to us. It's because we are sons of God. We are children of God. And as sons of God, we are led by the Spirit. So being led by the Spirit here in verse 13 seems to be the same thing as putting to death the deeds of the sinful body in verse 13. In other words, we are led by the Spirit to hate the things the Spirit hates, sin. We are led by the Spirit to love the things the Spirit loves, that being Christ. That's how we are led by the Spirit. Now MacArthur notes that we are as God's children, led by the Spirit in two primary ways. First, the Spirit leads us as God's children through illumination, by divinely clarifying his word to us, making it understandable, making it applicable to our finite and sin-stained minds. As we read and pray on and meditate over and pray over Scripture, the indwelling Spirit of God becomes our divine interpreter of his word. This began with the, at the very beginning with our conviction of sin that led to saving faith, but it doesn't stop there. It leads all the way through our Christian life. And Jesus promised regarding the coming helper, the Holy Spirit, in John 14, verse 25 and 26, that he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. And perhaps the most definitive passage on the illuminating work of the Spirit is in Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 14 to 16. The natural person, Paul writes, does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. The natural person, that is that, the one dead in sin. Why? They're folly to him. He's not able to understand them because they're spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. That is the illuminating work of the Spirit in our life. The second way in which the Spirit leads us as God's people is through our sanctification. The Spirit not only illuminates our minds to understand God's Word, but He divinely assists us in obeying it. And that obedience becomes another testimony to our salvation. Paul commanded the Galatians in Galatians 5, 16 and 17, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. 
The desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh, and these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. Now, how exactly this works in our life, as with the illuminating work of God, so with the sanctifying work of God, we don't always understand exactly how this plays out and works in our lives. But we simply know from his word, we often know from our experience, that he performs spiritual works in and through us that are not produced by our own efforts, that are not produced through our own power. As we are indwelt by the Spirit of God, as the children of God, we are led by the Spirit, led to pursue righteous living, led to renounce sin, led to understand and apply God's perfect and errant and divine word. That's what it looks like for this life in the Spirit to be a life of leading. Third, this life in the Spirit is a life of freedom. Look at what Paul goes on to say in verse 15. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. We're going to focus first on that first half of that verse. You did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. You see, the Spirit's presence in our lives makes all the difference in how we view these exhortations to holiness. His presence ensures that we are no longer slaves to a hostile master. The New Living Translation paraphrases this verse like this, you should not be like cowering, fearful slaves. You see, as we were outside of Christ, as we were under the law, as we were in Adam, We feared, didn't we? What was it that we feared? We feared God himself. We feared his righteous demands. We feared his divine justice, and we rightfully feared those things. We stood as enemies against him. We rebelled against his authority. We sinned against him, and we rightfully deserved all of his judgment, all of his wrath poured out upon our sin. This fear is the natural disposition of all men and women who are outside of Christ, whether they recognize it, whether they admit it or not. Listen to how MacArthur puts it. He writes, quote, No matter how cleverly they may manage to mask or deny the reality of it, sinful men are continually subject to fear because they continually live in sin and are therefore continually under God's judgment. Slavery to sin brings slavery to fear. And one of the gracious works of the Holy Spirit is to deliver God's children from both. You see, in Christ, as those filled by the Spirit of God, as those who live life in the Spirit of God, we are freed from that fear. We are freed from that slavery. And the reason we are freed from that fear and that slavery is because of what God has done for us in Christ. And Paul now continues regarding what God has done to look at our adoption in Christ. That leads to our fourth point, is a life not only of freedom, but a life of sonship. Look at the second half of verse 15. We receive the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. This glorious doctrine of our adoption as sons and daughters. This is not just referred to males. It's just the word that Scripture uses to point to our adoption. But this adoption as sons and daughters of the Father is one of the most important doctrines, I believe, in Scripture, and also one of the most underappreciated truths in all the New Testaments. So it's a little lengthier quote, but I want to read you a quote from the late theologian J.I. Packer. Many of you have read his book, Knowing God. In that book, Knowing God, he wrote this concerning our adoption in Christ. Quote, you sum up the whole of the New Testament teaching in a single phrase if you speak of it as a revelation of the fatherhood of a holy creator. In the same way, you sum up the whole New Testament religion if you describe it as the knowledge of God as one's holy father. If you want to judge how well a person understands Christianity, find out how much he makes of the thought of being God's child and having God as his father. If this is not the thought that prompts and controls his worship and prayers and his whole outlook on life, it means he does not understand Christianity very well at all. For everything that Christ taught 
everything that makes the New Testament new and better than the old, everything that is distinctly Christian as opposed to merely Jewish is summed up in the knowledge of the fatherhood of God. And he ends by saying this, Father is the Christian name of God. Sinclair Ferguson says something very similar, but much more succinctly. When he writes this, the notion that we are children of God, his own sons and daughters, is the mainspring of Christian living. Our sonship to God is the apex of creation and the goal of redemption. We see this concept of adoption featured throughout the scriptures. The first adoption recorded in scripture was that of Moses. Remember, Pharaoh ordered all of the male Hebrew children to be killed. Moses' mother places him in a basket, set him on the Nile. Pharaoh's daughter finds him, brings him to the palace, and adopts him into her family. We see another adoption in Esther being adopted by her older cousin Mordecai after her parents had died. Perhaps the most touching adoption that we find mentioned in the Old Testament was that of Mephibosheth, the crippled son of Jonathan, the sole remaining descendant of Saul. If you remember that story, King David learned about Mephibosheth. He gave him all the land that belonged to his grandfather, honored him by having him regularly dine at the king's table. And all of this was an act of sheer grace, sheer mercy to him. Nothing because of what he could do for David. We see Pharaoh's daughter adopt Moses out of pity and sympathy. We see Esther be adopted out of family duty. But David's adoption of Mephibosheth was purely motivated by undeserved, gracious love. David took the initiative in seeking him out and bringing him to the palace. Although Mephibosheth was the son of David's closest friend, he was also the sole heir of the man who repeatedly tried to kill David. Remember King Saul. Mephibosheth was also crippled in both feet. He was helpless. He was unable to offer David anything at all. And yet David brings this outcast to dine at his table as his own son. He graciously grants him an inheritance which he would have no legal entitlement to anymore. We see in this a beautiful picture of this spiritual adoption whereby God graciously and lovingly seeks out us unworthy men, unworthy women, out of his own initiative, makes us his children based nothing on what we have done ourselves, but based solely on our trust in Jesus Christ. We see this concept of adoption present some in Old Testament Israel, But it was much more prominent in the Roman culture of Paul's day, the culture of those to whom Paul is writing here in this letter. You see, adoption in the Roman world would have usually occurred when a wealthy adult did not have any heir for his estate. And so he would choose someone to adopt as his heir. Sometimes this would be a child, sometimes a teenager, sometimes even an adult. But as soon as this person was adopted, as soon as this adoption occurred, Several things were immediately true of this new son. Four things, to be precise. First, his old debts and his legal obligations were paid in full. They were completely done away with. They were completely paid. Second, he got a new name, and he was instantly the heir of all the father had. Third, his new father became instantly liable for all of his actions, for all of his crimes, for all of his debts, for anything And finally, on the flip side, the new son also had new obligations to honor and to please his father. Well, I think Paul, doubtless aware of this custom, of this procedure in the Roman world, he now picks up that same imagery to describe what God has done for us as his children, chosen by the father, adopted in Christ, and given the right to become heirs of all that is the Father's. Notice that all of these same elements that are true of the Roman adoption are true for us in Christ. At the moment of our conversion and our adoption as a son or daughter of God, all of our legal obligations and debts are paid. In Christ taking our full payment upon himself, our debt is paid, our sin is atoned for, the judgment, the wrath is removed. This is the glorious truth of justification by faith alone that we've been studying for months now. Second, at the moment of our conversion, 
and our adoption as a child of God, we are given a new name and are instantly the heir of all the Father has. We are now a Christian. We are now in Christ. And that inheritance that is ours is not contingent on us proving ourselves worthy of it. It's not held in limbo to see if we would live up to be a worthy child of God. No, we are instantly fellow heirs with Christ and heirs of all the Father has. The third, at the moment of our conversion, our adoption as a child of God, our Father becomes liable for all of our actions, our debts, and so forth. You see, Satan, as the great adversary that he is, he constantly wants us to turn our eyes inward upon ourselves, shaming us, racking us with guilt when we sin against God, convincing us that we are not worthy of his love, convincing us that we have incurred fresh guilt, fresh judgment, fresh wrath upon ourselves. But in Christ, we are not only wiped clean through the blood of Christ, but we are clothed with the very righteousness of Christ himself such that when the Father looks upon us, he sees the perfect righteousness of his own Son. And finally, at the moment of our conversion, the moment of our adoption as a child of God, we now, as the new child of God, have new obligations to honor and please our Father. That was the thrust of the first couple of verses of our passage this morning. Our life in the Spirit is to be a life of holiness, a life where we seek to honor and please and obey the Father who has lavished such love upon us. Listen, brothers and sisters, what a beautiful, a glorious, life-giving reality it is for us to know this morning that if we are in Christ, we are adopted as a son and daughter of the almighty creator king of the universe. We are his children. We are his sons. We are his daughters. We're reminded in this truth of our adoption in Christ that no one is born into this sort of relationship. No one is born into a true relationship with God. There are no natural biological offspring of God, as it were. No, yes, we are all created by God. So in that sense, we are all offspring of God. But in terms of our spiritual status, we are all born in Adam. We are all connected to Adam. We are all in Adam and are sinners eternally separated from our creator God. And there is nothing that a single one of us could ever do to earn our way into God's family, to atone for our sins, to reconcile ourselves with the Father. It is only through the supernatural, undeserved, unmerited, electing grace of our Father that he chose to choose us, to call us, to cover our sin all through the work of his Son and adopting us as his sons and daughters. We're also reminded in this truth that our relationship with God is based completely on a legal act by the Father. You do not win a father. You do not negotiate for a parent. Adoption is a legal act on the part of the Father, and a very costly one for him at that. There is nothing that the adopted child of God does to win or to earn this status. It is simply received. And finally, we are reminded in this truth of adoption of the intimacy that is ours as adopted children of God. Look at the cry that Paul mentions at the end of verse 15. We receive the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. That word Abba was an Aramaic term which was best translated as as Daddy, Papa. It was a term of the greatest intimacy. You see, a child doesn't always, in fact, I would say a child rarely addresses his father as father. Father, can I have a piece of candy? Father, can I have seconds for dinner? That's not how we talk to our father. This kind of stoic, you know, uh, regulated sort of way. No, a, a child has a much different way of showing in a loving, trusting familiarity with his father, calling the father dad, papa, daddy. This is the level of intimacy that we have with our heavenly father by virtue of being adopted in Christ. And notice that word cry there. We cry out to him with, with both an intimacy as well as a confidence. Confidence. 
We cry out to him like the author of Hebrews calls us to in Hebrews 4, verse 16. Let us then with confidence draw near, cry out to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find help in time of need. And Tim Keller once noted that the only person who dares wake up a king at 3 a.m. for a glass of water is a child. We have that kind of access, Keller says. We have that kind of intimacy. We are able to call out to him. We are able to cry out to him as our heavenly father because he has graciously adopted us as a son or a daughter through the perfect work of Christ for us. The revelation of this truth to the believer that God is our father is in a sense, as Packer put it, the very climax of the Bible. Well, as we consider our being indwelt by the spirit, we should not miss that this is a life of sonship. Fifth, very quickly, this is a life of assurance. As we are in the spirit, as we have this life in the spirit is a life of assurance. Look at how he continues in verse 16. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. You see, the Holy Spirit is not only instrumental in making us God's children, but he also makes us aware that we are God's children. Well, how does he do that in our lives? I don't think he does it in some sort of mystical way, as if we hear some sort of inner whisper in our spirit, you are a child of God. Rather, it seems the Spirit does this both scripturally as well as experientially. Uh, last year, we went, uh, we went through a study on this doctrine of assurance in our Wednesday night study with Joel Beakey. And in that study, we saw that our assurance is based on three things. The first and primary thing our assurance is based on is the divine promises of God in Scripture. We see scriptural promises that those who have trusted in Christ have their sins forgiven. So we ask ourselves, am I trusting in Christ? We have scriptural promises that if we confess our sin and believe upon Christ, we will be saved. So we look and we ask ourselves, am I confessing sin? Am I believing upon Christ? If the answer is yes, then I can have confidence and assurance of my salvation. Promise after promise in scripture is the surest assurance that we have for our assurance of salvation. But we secondly also have not only the divine promises of God in Scripture, but we have the personal evidences in our lives. So we look at our lives, we look at the spirit-wrought changes in our lives, obedience in our lives, and we see, we ask ourselves, do we see the spirit working? Do we see obedience increasing? Do we see sin decreasing? As we look at those things, we have further confidence of our, or hopefully we have further confidence of our assurance of salvation. But then he gives us a third thing, and, and Beaky argued that this was the last in the totem pole. If you kind of think about a pyramid, the promises of God in Scripture are the very foundation of that pyramid. And then the personal evidences in our life are the second layer of that pyramid, but a smaller component and then the final component, which is certainly true and certainly there in Scripture, but something that I don't think should be the primary thing we focus on, is what we see here in Romans 8, verse 16, which is that testimony of the Holy Spirit. Now, how exactly does he do this? How exactly does the Spirit himself testify with our spirit that we are children of God? Again, I don't think that it's some still, small voice telling us that we are God's children. Rather, as the Spirit produces fruit in our lives, as the Spirit illuminates our hearts and minds to understand all the riches that are ours in Christ, he serves as a defense witness, as it were, to serve as the expert witness to our inner spirit that we are indeed children of God. And we often can't place a finger on exactly what that looks like and exactly what that means in our lives. But I'm sure you have experienced, I have experienced it as well, just that overwhelming sense that these promises are not only true, but they're true for me. That this, everything that I read in scripture regarding what it means to be a son or daughter of God, everything that it means to be in Christ, that, that those are not only objectively true, but they are subjectively true in my life. I believe that when we have that extraordinary assurance in our lives, that is 
the very Spirit of God testifying with our spirit that we are children of God. The final mark of the Spirit-filled life that we see is actually one that we're not going to look at this morning because it is going to be the segue into our passage next week, but that is a life of suffering. Look at what Paul ends this verse with here in verse 17. Let's begin back in verse 16. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, verse 17, and if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Now notice the provision here. Provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. You see, as adopted children of God, we have a great inheritance to look forward to indeed. But it is an inheritance that is won through suffering. This life in Christ is not always butterflies and rainbows, is it? This life, this side of glory, is not always easy peasy and just everything goes well in our lives. No, this life, this side of glory, is a life of suffering. And as to that suffering, that groaning, not only of our own spirits, but the groaning of the very creation itself that Paul is going to turn to in our next passage next week, beginning in verse 18. And that's where we'll pause and we'll pick it up next week. But as we close our time in God's word this morning, I do pray that these reminders that we've seen in this passage, these reminders of what it means to be a spirit-filled follower of God, what it means to have a life in the spirit, I pray that it would be a source of encouragement and strengthening to you this morning, that you would see the beauty and glories of all that is ours in Christ that you would understand that this spirit-filled life is a life of holiness, a life of leading, a life of freedom, a life of sonship, a life of assurance, and a life of suffering. And I pray that as we focus on those things now, that we would go to the Lord in prayer, preparing our hearts, preparing our minds to come to this table afresh this morning, celebrating not only individually, but celebrating together corporately as God's people, all that God has done for us in Christ and his life, his death and his resurrection. Let's go to him now in prayer.